Today we're going to talk about a spiritual rest, a rest that points forward to Jesus who gives all of us ultimate, ultimate rest. So Matthew eleven twenty through 23, Jesus says, I, I want to give you rest. Physical rest? Yes. What's Jesus saying in these three verses here? Jesus is first saying, number one, Jesus is our righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. In this passage, when I come to him, what does he give to me? He gives me his righteousness. That's a church word. What does it mean? It means in Jesus, you have been declared good. You have been declared perfect. When God looks at you, it's as if he's looking at his son, Jesus. You have been declared perfect and right. And I know many of us in the room do not feel that. We're we're drawn by our emotions and our feelings, and sometimes we let them drive the bus. But here's the truth. I'm so grateful we have a Bible that tells us the truth, and we're not left to our own thoughts. The Bible tells us, in Jesus, you have been declared right. When God looks at you today, you are perfect through Jesus. I don't know how you feel, but the truth is, in Jesus, you have been made perfect you have been declared good and right. That's what it means by receiving the righteousness of Jesus. When we come to Jesus, all who are weary and burdened, what are we burdened with? We're burdened with sin, and the brokenness of this world. We are looking at the last week of a series called Rest for the Weary. Rest for the Weary, and it's so unrelatable to any of us, right? Right? Anyone in the room needs, needs some rest. Today, I'm gonna, we're going to end this series. We're going to look at physical rest. And we're going to look at spiritual rest, physical and spiritual. Both are really important. Spiritual rest is even more important than physical rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. I challenged all of us to memorize this passage. How are you doing on that? Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden or burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We see the word rest here. It should bring us to, when we start talking about physical rest, Exodus 20, one of the top 10 commandments Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, and he made it holy. What's this passage telling us? Three things. Number one, God is the point of our lives. Your job is not the point of your life. Where you go on Monday morning through Friday afternoon or evening or what you do on the weekends, that is not the point of your life. Your relationship with God is the point of your life. Number two, this passage, this commandment reminds us that God is the provider of our lives. You ultimately are not the provider of your life. You ultimately are not the provider of your family. God is the provider. And by stopping... And having a finish line every week and every day, you're saying, God, I trust you with the rest. I'm stopping. The work's not done, but I'm going to ask that you would provide the rest. God is the point of our life. Number two, he's the provider of our lives. And number three, God is the savior of our life. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, 12 through 15, it says, observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. What do you do on the Sabbath? What do you do with the time that you set aside? You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. What do you do on the Sabbath? What do you do on your time? You recognize that you are not your Savior. You don't do anything. When we're saved, Jesus does all the work. And so we're told to stop thinking like slaves and start acting and thinking like sons and daughters of the living God. Some of us are thinking and acting like slaves, like we're still in Egypt. We're bound to our job. We never stop. We never have a finish line. Jesus at the cross, we're going to look at this. At the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. He didn't say, I got it started. Now you go and do the rest. He says, I've done all the work. 
for, for you. Three things they would reflect on during the Sabbath. God was the point, God is the provider, and God is the Savior. In Hebrews 4, Joshua, it says, For if Joshua, Moses' successor, had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest is also rested from his works as God did from his. The Sabbath that Moses and Joshua instituted did not provide the ultimate rest. It was a temporary rest. It was a rest that allowed them to stop working. But today we're going to talk about a spiritual rest, a rest that points forward to Jesus who gives all of us ultimate, ultimate rest. So Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Jesus says, I, I want to give you rest. Physical rest? Yes. What's Jesus saying in these three verses here? Jesus is first saying, number one, Jesus is our righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. In this passage, when I come to him, what does he give to me? He gives me his righteousness. That's a church word. What does it mean? It means in Jesus, you have been declared good. You have been declared perfect. When God looks at you, it's as if he's looking at his son, Jesus. You have been declared perfect and right. And I know many of us in the room do not feel that. We're, we're drawn by our emotions and our feelings, and sometimes we let them drive the bus. But here's the truth. I'm so grateful we have a Bible that tells us the truth, and we're not left to our own thoughts. The Bible tells us, in Jesus, you have been declared right. When God looks at you today, you are perfect through Jesus. I don't know how you feel, but the truth is, in Jesus, you have been made perfect you have been declared good and right. That's what it means by receiving the righteousness of Jesus. When we come to Jesus, all who are weary and burdened, what are we burdened with? We're burdened with sin, and the brokenness of this world. Christ is our Sabbath. Our relationship with Jesus is our Sabbath. He saved us. And just like with Israel, he accomplished it all himself. We didn't bring anything to the table. He took my sin, my sorrow. He made them his very own. He bore our burden to Calvary. There are a lot of things we cooperate with God together day to day, but our salvation is not one of them. That's something he has given to us as a free gift. Jesus doesn't give us an instruction manual with an explanation of how to save ourselves. He did the work and told us to only believe it and receive it. And if you today have not received that free gift, it is something simply you receive. You come to Jesus, you receive it. The repentant heart, the humble heart, the heart that says I'm broken and I'm in need of a Savior, Jesus is gentle and lowly for you. Jesus says it is finished. Not I got it started, now go do the rest. Three ways we can find physical rest. Let me just hit these and we'll talk about spiritual rest. We'll talk about spiritual rest here real quick. The first is find time, find a Sabbath, whether it's a 24-hour period of time. The early church moved it from Saturday to Sunday because they thought, what better way to start our week than to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus? We're going to come together corporately like we're doing together. That's it's a tradition for a couple thousand years. This has been happening all around the world. The church gathers together to celebrate Jesus when do you personally find Sabbath in your own schedule? Daily Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, annual Sabbath? Do you take vacations? You're like, we can't afford a vacation. No, staycation. What do you do to stop working daily? What's your finish line daily? What's your finish line weekly? Because when you stop, you're saying, God, I did everything I could do this week. You knew what I had come up. You knew the calls. You knew the emails. You knew the crises. I did what I could, I could do. Now I'm going to stop and I'm going to trust you to fill in the gaps. What does that look like in your schedule, in your day-to-day -day life? The things that you cannot finish, when do you stop and then you trust God with the rest? The first is the, the day off. The second is giving. It might surprise you. How do we put our trust in God and Sabbath? By trusting him that he has provided everything we have. Every penny I've ever earned has been given to me by God. Every, 
every possession. He owns it all anyway, and giving is an opportunity to declare to God that I trust you with not just what I have, but everything that is to come. So you have an opportunity to give. Give to your local church. Giving an important part of following Jesus. And if you're like, well, I don't know Boulder Mountain, give to a church. This is not about what we want from you. This is about what God wants for you. And when you give, you end up living on less than, than more. It's, when you follow Jesus, it flips everything upside down. You say, I can't afford to give. Well, I, I'll tell you my personal experience. I can't afford to not give. I can't afford to live life without acknowledging that God has given everything I own, he has given to me, and this is a small portion of what I can give back to him. You decide that between you and your relationship with God. You get to decide that on, on your own. Giving. The third one, I didn't get any amens on giving, but I might get one on, on this third one. Sleep. Sleep. Amen? I'm enjoying sleep the older I get. I'm enjoying sleep. I used to not enjoy sleep because I had FOMO, fear of missing out. So I, I didn't want to sleep because I felt like I was missing out on stuff. But the older I get, the more I enjoy sleep. Psalm 127.1. Did you know this was in the Bible? Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to bed late. Eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. How do you know that God loves you? He gives you sleep. Amen? Amen. When you lay your head on the pillow at night, you can say, let me give you a prayer that you can say, dear God, I am tired. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> what are you declaring? I'm done. I've got nothing else. God, I, I'm going to stop. And as I sleep, what is sleep? Sleep is a type of Sabbath that God has built into our bodies that we are required, we must have at some point. We must have sleep. And as we sleep, we trust the God who never slumbers. The Bible tells us God never slumbers. He has the shift. He has the midnight shift, the 1 a.m. shift, the 2 a.m. shift. And sometimes we wake up and we're worried and we're like, who's going to build the house? I have found in my life when I get more responsibility, sometimes I feel like, well, who's going to do that? Who's going to be responsible for building the house? And the passage the psalmist tells us, unless the Lord builds the house, we all labor in vain. It doesn't matter how early you wake up or how late you go to bed. Listen, you're going to be a lot more productive if you let him take care of the midnight shift. And sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night and we're, there's anxiety and there's worry about the conversation, about the meeting, about whatever's happening in our life. But when we lay our heads down on that pillow, and I know some of you might be, well, here's some herbal remedies or here's some oils or you don't have the right pillow. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the anxiety and the worry that we we carry with us. Sometimes I sleep badly because I, I worry about who's watching the city, who's watching the house, who's watching my family, who's watching the church. You fill in the blanks. Why do you wake up in the middle of the night to say, God, I'm going to trust you. God wants me to lay down each night just to remind myself that I'm not God. When we lay our heads on the pillow, we're declaring we are not God. And God is always doing 10,000 different things in your life. In fact, right now, Jesus is just as active as he was as when he went to the cross. Jesus is not just sitting around with his, with his feet on the coffee table in heaven. Jesus is actively working on your behalf right now in this very second. He is interceding for you. He is advocating for you before the Father. Jesus is at work. All right, three things. You can find rest, and it's a declaration of you trusting God. One is find a rhythm of Sabbath rest. Number two, give to declare that, God, you own it all. And three, sleep. Sleep well. It's biblical. We find in this passage we find when Jesus, when we come to Jesus, there's a few things that we find. 
We find that Christ is our righteousness, as I mentioned earlier. We also find that Christ is our identity. If we don't understand as followers of Jesus that my identity ultimately comes from my relationship with Jesus, then I'm going to find my identity in my job. Right? I've wrestled with this. There's been times in my life I found my worth and my value as a pastor. That is not what God wants me to find my worth. Whatever occupation you have in your life, whatever you've given your career to, that is not your identity. That is not what Jesus wants you to find your identity in. Your identity is found in Christ. He's given us a new identity. I'm no longer a stranger. I'm no longer an orphan before God. I'm a son or daughter of God, a brother or sister with Christ. As his child, I've been given specific gifts for his kingdom. One of my favorite movies, Chariots of Fire. It's an old one. It's, it's a classic. In that movie, it chronicles the rise of Eric Liddell, the Olympic athlete in 1924. He determines that he's only going to run. He's not going to run on the Sabbath. He viewed the Sabbath. He's not going to run that day. That's the day we're going to celebrate the resurrection. But in that line, he says, I run to glorify God, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. His identity was found in his relationship with Jesus, and then his purpose came out of that. Where do you find pleasure? What has God called you to do that when you do it, you find his pleasure? In the movie's counter hero, Harold Abraham's running wasn't about pleasing God. It was about proving his purpose. Running gave him, he said, 10 lonely seconds to justify his whole existence. Some of us are doing it. We're trying to justify our existence by our work. All our work will be done for one of two purposes. All our work, all our labor will either be done for our own glory or for the glory of God. It's a good question to ask when we roll out of bed in the morning. For whose glory am I getting out of bed today? For whose glory? Is it for my own glory, for my own kingdom, or for the kingdom of God? Some of us are working 60, 70 hours a week to justify our whole existence. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our identity. And Christ is my security. I find security in Christ. No matter what happens with our jobs and our careers or what happens, ultimately, our security is found in Jesus. Now we come to Matthew 11, 28 through 30. There's one place in all the Gospels, 89 chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we learn a lot about Jesus. We learn a lot of the places that he went. We learn a lot about what he did, the miracles and his teachings and who he had lunch with and who he went on the boat with. We learn a lot of things. There's only one place in the entire Bible where we get to see the heart of Jesus. And it's in this passage. The only place where, where Jesus reveals his heart. And we talk about the heart, what are we talking about? When you pull back the chest cavity and you see who, what, who is Jesus? What are the characteristics of Jesus? What does he use to define himself? Now, if you and I were to be asked that question, what would he define himself? I would think holy and set apart and dignified and loving and joyful and all these characteristics. That's not what he chooses to describe himself as. Look there in the text. What does he say? He says, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. This is not something he does. This is who he is. Right? Who is Jesus? He is gentle and lowly in heart. I'm thinking gentle is another word for and lowly is humble. There's only four times in the New Testament where you see that word mentioned. One is the meek will inherit the earth, right? Gentle and, and lowly. I'm thinking, why does Jesus need to be humble? He's perfect. He's holding the universe in his hands right now. What in the world does he need to be humble? Do you know why Jesus is humble? So he can relate to you and I. Jesus is holding, Colossians tells us, the universe in his hand. Everything in the universe is being held together through Jesus, and yet he describes himself as gentle and lowly. He's not one or the other. 
gentle and lowly. If he was just gentle and lowly, he could commiserate with us and he could have empathy and sympathy, but he couldn't do anything about your sin. If he was just holding the universe together and he's this distant God in a faraway land, then he wouldn't care about you on a personal level. But he is both. Jesus is gentle and lowly. Hebrews says he sympathizes with all of our weaknesses. Everything, every feeling you have ever felt, he can relate to except sin. Jesus, Hebrews makes that clear. He cannot relate to the sin that we've experienced. And this is really important when it comes to our understanding of who God is. Because I have to admit to you, there are days where I wake up and I think about, I think about my relationship with God, and I have to admit personal confession to you. There are some days I wake up and I think, how long is it going to go before I disappoint God today? Is today just going to be another day where I disappoint God? Is, this, is today another day where Jesus is just going to shake his head and say, what a dummy? Has anybody ever thought that? Has anybody ever thought another day that God is disappointed with me, another day of rolling out of the bed, hoping to get most of it right? Some of us think, well, yeah, Jesus forgives my sin, but he does so holding his nose as he gets close to me. Sometimes we think of, we manufacture a thousand different reasons where we think that God isn't going to accept me and be pleased with me today. And if, if you've ever thought that, you're in good company. Most people think that. But that is not healthy theology. That is not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that Jesus, his nature is he's gentle and lowly. He wants our, for us to give him our sin. This is, this, this, he's desiring that. He doesn't stand against you because of your sin. He stands with you and he stands with me against our sin. That is really, really important to distinguish Jesus is not against you because of your sin. He is for you, and he stands with you against your sin. You and I have a common enemy with Jesus, and that is our sin. He loves you. He is gentle and, lo and lowly. He is humble. He wants you to come to him as who he is. When you prick him, this is what comes out. When you prick God of the Old Testament, sometimes we think Old Testament, New Testament, God's different. No, they're one and the same. The Old Testament prophets all are rolling out the red carpet pointing to Jesus. They're all talking about this characteristic of who God is. He is slow to anger. The Bible tells us you and I need to be provoked. In Hebrews, it says provoke one another toward what? Love. You and I need to be provoked to love because you know what our natural state is? Our natural heart is evil and wicked. Our natural state is anger and bitterness. Our, our, our heart is, but God, 42 times in the Old Testament, it says God is, he was provoked to anger because love is his natural characteristic. He's, he's full of compassion. It's who he is. And he, he loves us. You know, all that we experience in creation is an overflow of his love that was bubbling up over. The Trinity was not bored. The Trinity in the community of the Trinity, the love for us created the universe, right? The, tr the Trinity created the universe for, for our enjoyment because God loves us. Jesus is, is gentle and lowly. I remember a, a time when I was in high school, I got my first road trip. I got permission to drive my car from... Iowa to Indiana where my best friend lived and they sat me down and gave me all the instruction. I was 16, you know, what to do and what not to do and, and I'm, I'm driving. They didn't tell me that I might be pr prone to falling asleep with the vibration of the cars, you know, <clears throat> the wheels on the highway. So I fell asleep and put the car in the ditch and fortunately uh, God protected me. One of the many times God saved my life, I think. But I put the car in the ditch, and I, my car was damaged, and I continue on to see my best friend. And my dad said, hey, when you get there, call. Call and tell me about the trip. So I call him, and he asks me, how was your trip? And I lied. It was fine. I made it here. Everything's good. I put it off because I was worried about his reaction. I was worried about what he's going to think of me. 
I was worried he's never going to let me drive across the country. He's never going to let me have a car ever again. All these things. So I lie to him. So a week goes by, and I come home, and I park the car in the driveway in such a way that he wouldn't see the damage to the car, and the, the fan wasn't working, the engine light's on. I mean, it's a, it's a disaster. I just I keep hiding it. I keep putting it off until one day I'm in my room, and I heard my name yelled. My, my dad saw the car. Some of us view God that way. I, I don't want to tell him. I don't want to reveal to him. Listen, my friends, he already knows. His desire is to have a personal conversation about your sin. Jesus is waiting. This is who he is. He's gentle and humble. He's waiting for you to come to him. And he, his only reaction will be to not point a finger at you, but to wrap his arms around you and say, I, I understand. He loves you. He wants you to come to him. If there is unconfessed sin in this room, if there is things that you've never confessed to God before today, I'm going to encourage you to do that. You look at Jesus. He is gentle and humble. He is waiting for you to share with him. All throughout the Old Testament, the character of God is is shared. Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. When I feel disgusted, when I feel ashamed, when I feel like I don't want to get near God after I sin, I don't know if anybody else in the room has ever thought this, I I sin, I need to confess to God. I'm like, I'm going to give it some time. I'm going to have a really good day, and then I'll come to God. Maybe somehow that will make the conversation go a little bit better. Anybody relate to that? When you picture God coming before him, and I'm just trying to say to you the theology of the Bible is Jesus wants us to come to him with everything, to confess to him with everything. The book of James says you may find healing when you confess your sins one to another. That's why it's important to also have a community of friends that you can share with. Confess to God. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Now, he is not gentle and lowly with everybody. I want to make that really clear. Who is he gentle and lowly with? Those who come to him those who take his yoke, those who exchange their burdens for what he has. Because prior to that, the passage that we're looking at, he is not gentle and lowly with the unrepentant. And so the call is today that we would, we would come to Jesus and he will deal with us gently. If you've not confessed your sin to him, Would you do that in your own heart, in your own mind? Would you take the time to have a conversation with him? It's why groups and relationships are so important here at Boulder Mountain. You would be in a relationship. You'd be in a group. I've got a group on Tuesday mornings. I feel like I could share anything with a group of guys, and they're going to love me, accept me, and and say, we love you as you are, but not as you should be here. Let me give you some hope. We have a, a men's group on Tuesday night. We have women's groups. We have couples groups. We have groups that are meeting in homes, meeting here at the church. If you don't have friendships that you can be open and honest with, let me encourage you to find friendships. You want to do a deeper dive into this topic, I encourage you, Gentle and Lowly, the book by Dane Ortland. There's a, another book, a Puritan theologian, lived from 1600 to 1680. He wrote a 500-page volume about the heart of Christ. The Puritans, man, they would take one verse and they'd write like 12 commentaries on it. Incredible. Do a deep dive into the heart of Christ. Some of us, we need to change our thinking of who God is. I talk to people sometimes like, I'm going to walk into church and a lightning bolt's going to strike me down. Wherever they heard that couldn't be farther from the truth. When we come to Jesus, he deals with us gently. He's a loving father. There's nothing that you know that he doesn't know. But he's longing for a personal conversation with you about your sin. If there's anyone here in the room who's never surrendered their life to Jesus, now is the time to do that. To completely say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. I'm not my savior. I'm not my provider. I've made other things the point of my life, but I'm recognizing that for this very short time on this earth, 
I'm going to surrender my life to you. We're going to move toward a time of baptism, and I just want to share with you what baptism is. It's the mission of the church lived out. Jesus makes it really, really clear what the mission of the church is. Go into all the world, teaching and what? And baptizing. What is baptism? Baptism is a public expression of an inward decision. The inward decision is when we come to Jesus. For anyone who's come to Jesus, you've given your life to Jesus, and you've not been baptized, today you have an opportunity to be baptized. It's, it's telling your church, it's telling your family, it's telling your friends, I'm a follower of Jesus, and my desire is to follow Jesus the rest of my life. Throughout the Bible, faith always precedes baptism. Baptism does not save you. Baptism doesn't make God love you more after you go into the water than before. There's nothing special about the water. There's nothing holy about the water. I got it from the hose outside. It is heated, though, and clean, just to clarify. But it is a public expression. Why do we baptize? Because Jesus was baptized, and we're told as a church to baptize. And so let me pray, and then we'll invite the candidates up. Father, thank you that we are letting the children come to you this morning. We, we're asking that you would give these candidates boldness as they stand before their friends and their small group leaders and uh, their parents, and they're saying, I'm trusting Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins, placing my faith and trust in him. My desire is to follow Jesus the rest of my life. I pray for these who are going into the water for this next week. There is someone who does not want them to make this decision public, and I pray you would protect them, you would give them boldness and courage this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.